Today, I have the honor of Dr. Alia Ahmed joining me for the journey. Um, I always start the pod with who you are to me. Okay. Like, you know, oh, I've wow. got I've gotten to know you over, when was the first time I was in? About a year ago? Um, yeah, about a year ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, background of who you are, you are the founder of and the, you know, chief medical officer. Yeah of Shaw Minds Healing Center in Sacramento, which is a uh, psychedelic uh, healing center, um, kind of first of its kind in the Sacramento region. And I had my first session, whew, that was beginning of 2022, I believe. Um, first time kind of working with ketamine, um, coming into your guys' facility. I was plugged into you actually to through Eric Goodman, who was my tattoo artist? Oh yeah, and he had mentioned he did. I did. Yes. I think he did a mural with you guys, or. Yes. Uh-huh. And so, anyways, he was like, hey, "You need to connect with these 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 women. They're doing mm-hmm. incredible work. You guys hadn't started the facility yet." Um, but I remember going, had my first introduction. I was there. I had my consultation, and I, I was just. I remember walking in and just feeling like. I'd never been to a assisted, uh, you know, assisted um, psychedelic facility before, like in this above board style that you guys have. And I remember walking in and just seeing the facility and seeing the care that you guys had put into all the rooms and literally had created the ultimate facility to have these experiences. Um and just going in and just being like, wow, this is like a really safe place. And then meeting you and your sister and just feeling so comfortable. Like just, you guys always have a smile. Mm-hmm. You guys give me a hug from the first time. So I, I've, you know, you as a person I've gotten to know and your business, I've just seen how much care and how much this matters to you. You have a whole career prior to this in healthcare and transitioning. This feels like a legacy play that you guys are doing, like really caring into the holistic human. Um, so I've just really want to acknowledge and honor what you've created. Just, you've made me feel safe. Um, and I just, your place is a refuge for me. And, you know, I've come back a number of times and had some very impactful and beautiful experiences. And I just think you guys have done an incredible job at what you've created. Thank you for so much of what you, everything you said, it means a lot. Um, as you said, uh, this is a, a legacy. Um, it really is a, you know, something that I think I've felt for a, a long time in medicine. Um, I've been practicing now. I, you know, after twenty four or five years now, of medicine practicing from all the training that's required in from medical school, residency, and then you know, I was in academics. I was in faculty position, teaching you know, very interested in research, very interested in providing that primary care, care. Um, and it really, over the course of this time, has been a struggle to provide that care that mm. you go into medical school with, that you go to, um, you know, that you, you em- want to emulate uh, as, a, as a way of caring for people, you know. Um, it really... Um, has always kind of been there, but it's changed and evolved so much over this course of time. Technology impacted that as well as that relationship with your patients. Um, so, and and knowing that you know there could be something this this hasn't have to be this way, you know, knowing that it it you know there's uh, there's got to be other ways. So um, you know, learning that art of healing um, and learning how to really understand. Um, people in their conditions, and and it's not what the condition is that you're really working on. You're working on that, all aspects of that person's life. Mm. So, um, but you don't have the time to do this in conventional medicine as it is right now. Um, you get 15, 20 minutes per patient, and half of that is paperwork. The other half is like getting things going, ordering stuff on the, you know, you know, typing up your notes and doing it while you have this slotted time. Um, and you still struggle with that. You still struggle with, you know, you keeping up with the system that requires these things, but you're really pulled to the to the needs of the patient and yet your hands are tied. Mm. You know? So it's it's a very compromised position. 
Um, and, you know, I developed all kinds of uh, programs in training in obesity. I set up, cl you know, classes with patients and really assessing their response of how they're going to get better. Um, I developed a Down syndrome um, center um, and really focus was on the whole, the whole child, uh, preventing, you know, children with Down syndrome from ending up in the hospital, which is what I saw, you know, a lot of. Uh, things that can be prevented, and doing it with that whole whole child care oversight. You mm -hmm. know, being that advocate for that for that family, and saying these are the things that need that coordination that's required. Um, and I developed a complex care clinic with the same idea. You know, um, and then comes my own work. You know, tell me a little about that because they're going from the traditional healthcare model all the. Th the world that, you know, brought up through that system, um, extremely successful. You know, you've had clinics all over the world. Um, tell me about how you transitioned from traditional healthcare to this world that you are in now. I'm sure there's... Yeah, it, it came with my own, uh, recognizing my own trauma mm. um, and recognizing my own trauma through... Uh, a means I would never have done in, in, and never did, uh, sitting there with a, you know, plant medicine uh, with a group and working and taking time to do this because you want to support somebody. You know, my own sister uh, wanted, me, wanted me to engage with her while she was in her healing. And she was always our, um, you know, who was always a little different. And always did things differently, mm. um, and and she needed support, and she asked me to uh, be with her in the journey, and also do the journey with her, uh, which um, opened my eyes um, in that state, in that really getting to that subconscious state. I was able to recognize my own pain and trauma, which I had denied um, because. We weren't allowed to talk about those things. We, those, you know, those traumas are not to be, you know, just forgotten. There, no, there's nothing. Um, there's no, you know, there's a lot of fear around any kind of trauma, expressing that trauma. Were you aware of them or was it by doing some of this initial plant medicine, psychedelic work that those started to surface and you realized you yeah, understood them? It, I had my own trauma for, as being an immigrant crossing over from four continents until we got to America, so Africa, Asia, Europe, lived in all those countries, and then came come to America, uh, you know, as an immigrant, and worked through all of those um, traumas that I hear and hear from families even now. Um, as, but then I was functional, I was good, I was the best student. I tried mm. my best. I did. I did. I was a golden child, uh, and and. Um, and I had my own trauma in terms of, you know, post during, you know, during our training, medical school, lots of things happened. Um, you get hit with trauma. You know, you're taking care of, you know, really critical situations in the hospital, in your training especially. And uh, there's no time to talk about the impact that that has when you see a dying child, you know, mm. who, who doctors aren't, you know, you're not engaged in that. You, you just have to do the work and get the work done and communicate that. Um, so then recognizing my own trauma, my own issues, uh, I came to the opening that this is, this is really powerful. Um, and it allowed me to really be in a place of, of, of reflection, of connecting to self is what I say, um, now. And so I had to understand it. I had to, I had to study it. I had to really, really look at the neuroscience uh, in this and it's and it makes so much sense mm. you know we, we've been taught medicine uh, all the wrong way um you know focus on systems focus on the organ disease we've forgotten that the person is more than just the body there's there's the spirituality of the body there's within the spiritual there's this consciousness connection that we have to nature to sound to all our senses we are connected um, both physiologically, you know, spiritually. Um, and so recognizing the power of this, um, because it draws you in into all aspects of who people are, mm -hmm. their mind, their body, their soul, 
And then talking about healing through that modality was powerful. So intuitively, it made so much sense. And physiologically, it makes sense. And you discovered that, like, your, so you started out with your sister, you know, kind of supporting her, like, maybe less for you and more for her. Yeah. And then quickly did that become a you thing? Yes, like, it became a you thing. I opened up to um, a lot of those, the way healing affects your body. You know, I understood. I get, I understood. Oh, okay. Makes sense. Makes so much sense that when, you know, when trauma hits the body, what is it supposed to do? It's supposed to make a mark, right? It happens in the memory. The mind has to remember that trauma. It's just your immune system indicating, just like you get any kind of infection, your body gets exposed to it a little bit. The next time, it's more prepared. Mm. Same thing trauma does to the nervous system. Um, and, and we, you know, we have to be honest, uh, too, that there's a way the body responds as it's supposed to respond, and there's a way that the body responds and gets over-triggered and over, um, and under, over and over, under and around that, the same trauma, which may or may not be present at that time, but has made its mark. So it's almost like the body's doing what it's supposed to do. It, it's going to respond. It's now aware of this trauma and it has a mechanism to respond to it, but we haven't really, through time in our systems, had a way of transforming that trauma. Is it almost like, is this a, is that fair to say? Like it gets stuck in our body? Yeah. And then that can manifest into disease, into um, different ailments. Is that? Yes. Is that um, so, you know, after discovering the, 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 this, the science behind this is, is ever, I mean, there's so much more to, be, to know, but also that makes, you know, looking back at the way the body responds to trauma, you know, hormonally. Right, the cortisol system gets mm. activated. Where, you know, uh, its armies are up. Immune system has to get alert. You know, the uh, the body mechanisms. The, um, the heart has to respond. The kidney has to be on guard. Everything has to be. You know, and systems are in play. You know, there's this interaction of, of physical processes that are happening. Um, it makes sense that when you do have that elevated or cortisol response, it does that. Um, but over time, if this is something that's happening to the toxic levels, um, it makes its mark as well uh, on how children respond, especially early on, mm. you know, the architectural changes it makes in the body. Um, so anger, rage, when that's held in, in, internally as, as this physiological response, but we feel it like it's emotional, as it is, um, over time, when that happens over and over again, it keeps that body in that activated state. Um, no, no time for relaxation, right? The heart has to be tense. Of course, it's going to get hypertension. You know, of course, it's going to not going to beat as normal. It may have arrhythmias. Um, so, you know, realizing that our approach to the person is, and how we're treating people. Um, we have to know the science mm -hmm. and we have to be able to connect. So who is that person? Why is this happening? As opposed to just looking at the symptom, there's sounds of it. It's like trauma is the genesis of everything we see. And is trauma, I know that word sometimes, at least when I hear it, it's like we think of trauma as like the most extreme things. Like you witnessed a death or a murder, you were raped or some of these like very extreme moments that can trigger trauma. But there is also, we all have forms of trauma, micro forms of trauma, correct? That mm -hmm. are playing out, that are, doesn't really matter the event. It's just how the body responds internally that right. creates, that can right. be a trauma. Um, yeah, I think trauma can be, um, you know, we talk about it as a, uh, you know, in, and that may be very true when you have bad things happen to mm. you, especially at an early age. Um, but trauma is who you are too. You know, you are who you are because of trauma. Interesting. So it's 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 we look at trauma early in childhood as a big marker and makes a bigger hit because on the developing brain, you know, it makes. Um, but as 
because and and also you're learning styles of um you're you're learning the style of uh recognizing how you respond to trauma as, developmentally you know um as you age as you grow so and what age that makes its hit makes its hit on that developmental age as well and it may stay there um so so the body's effect of trauma physiologically impacting you know how the heart responds but also how the brain would respond at that developmental age so understanding that um and really um then talking about well it's not the trauma is a, a problem but it makes its wound it marks itself there um and it becomes a fragile place so how, how do you for like you know children it's a time that we're like you said it has it's a deeper impact a developing brain you know as an adult there are new forms out there that we can work through trauma therapy assisted therapy with psychedelics some of these other things psychedelics probably aren't for children um you know i don't i don't know your opinion on that but i'm curious what are some forms to aid this transformation of trauma when children are young as opposed to waiting to learn adult for any parents listening out there. Hmm. Yes. Um, um, you know, like I was talking about when you're, um, as you're growing as a child, um, the ages of how you learn about security um, is that early age. Mm. So the impact of losing that security, losing that attachment, that bond, and that the person that we're engaging with and learning that attunement, that neuroregulation attunement, um, losing that in that early age leaves, leaves you insecure and makes that hit of insecurity. So that ability to attach to, say, a loved one later on in life becomes difficult because you have this insecure response to attachment. You know, you need it, but then you want, you, you, you're so, um, insecure about it, that your authenticity goes. Mm. So understanding, like I said, that developmental impact um, at an early age, because it does make a bigger hit um, on a developing brain, it becomes a bigger separation to that stability of, of attachment mm -hmm. and the instability of that, the avoidant and that. So that break in that response may be bigger. Um, and these are just, you know, there's, um, we'd have to look at more of that evidence, uh, with that. It, it, this is an idea. This is a, a belief that yes, it does def developmental trauma affects the brain as it's growing. Um, what can you do about it? Um, what are the things that, uh, again, um, are helpful? Um, and you mentioned that can, you know, that psychedelics aren't for children, but there are many cultures in traditional indigenous cultures that practice in early in mm -hmm. provide psychedelics as a way of life um, in that traditional sense. Um, but ketamine is a what we call a legal psychedelic. Mm -hmm. um, it's a chemical. Schedule yeah. three, correct? Schedule three. Correct. A medicine that we have used in kids even um, since it first came. And it's been, you know, um, well utilized in the emergency rooms, in the hospitals for short-term procedures, um, given for an anesthetic response mm. for the, you know, just to numb the area, uh, but not have um, somebody require breathing support because you can be sitting and talking um, and you won't uh, feel somebody suturing your arm. So, and you won't even notice your arm. You'll be talking, uh, you'll be, and you, as a doctor, you'd be suturing them and they'd be talking to you and tell, talking, you know, and these are children too, you know. Um, so it's that short course anesthetic, very safe, very effective for that short period, period of time. Um, I guess I'm moved on to a, a topic about ketamine. Yeah, let's <laughs> dive into that. I mean, that's, that's the one that, you know, your facility, has in place that is, you know, legal to go do right now. It is, um, is that federally scheduled? It, you know, that's Federal a federally schedule. one. So that's, that's why you see much more of the ketamine clinics. The other ones you, we might hear is the MDMA assisted psychotherapy. It's in phase three trials, maybe moving past that, maybe mm -hmm. coming online soon, mm -hmm. but ketamine is the main one that's moved into schedule three that is actually 
facilities can be utilized. Yes. You can go in and book appointments and do this. So yeah. give me a breakdown of what is ketamine. Um, yeah, let's start there. Okay. As ketamine is, a like I said, an anesthetic drug, um, and we use it in hospitals, we used it for a long time. Um, uh, ketamine, um, at that lower end of, the do of, of dose, less than what you use in the hospitals, what we call the sub-anesthetic dose, um, allows, again, for that relaxation of the nervous system, um, that disassociation uh, effect, which I'll talk about, um, but um, also um, creates what, we, what in medicine we used to call hallucinations. Um, so we would say, oh, yeah, this child's on ketamine. It's coming back from the OR. She may be a little loopy. Or she may be, uh, and the children would describe seeing balloons and apples and, you know, they're floating in the sky. And yeah. You look like this. And they would talk to you and they would say, I'll tell you these things. Um, so at the sub-anesthetic dose, it goes, people are, go into that psychedelic state. Um and in that psychedelic state, again, there is that separation of the mind and the body, right? Um, your mind is able to expand. And that's the meaning of psychedelic is mind manifesting. Your mind is able to open up. The default mode network of your body relaxes, as as does in MD and other psychedelic substances like MDMA, LSD, psilocybin. Same thing. There's a relaxation of one part of, the, of that nervous, that brain, um, that is... Um, your focused brain, the brain that says, I have to do this, got to get this done, got to get it. Don't worry about the art and the wall. Don't, don't see this. Don't worry about that. It's, I've got to get this done. That turns down. And your, the brain is able to access other parts of the system that it doesn't get to because it's always so nervous and always got to be like this. I want to jump <laughs> in there real quick because you use the term hallucin hallucination. And I'm always, I get a little... I'm more into, like, I, I prefer the term psychedelic and hallucination just seems like it's kind of like a, it's a fake manifestation or it's some, right. where, where you're saying it's like, we're just opening into something that is there that we just don't normally have access to. Yes. Is that how? Yes. So a mind, a psychedelic state can be achieved by pure mindfulness, right? You can achieve, you can do that. You can achieve that psychedelic state through breath. Um, through really mm -hmm. a specific type of breathing techniques, which we call holotropic breath work, you can achieve that psychedelic state. You don't need medicine to do that. Um, but how, how, how well do we do that, right? So that access, that sense of presence, that, you know, being in a, in a you know, in that open, like I said, all the connections are being kind of, wow, mm -hmm. refig reconfigured as an opportunity. Um, that ability to do that. We do that every night when we sleep, when we're dreaming. Same thing happens in, in, when you're dreaming and your body's resting and in that um, disassociative state. You're not worried about your body while you're dreaming. Your mm -hmm. mind is expanding. You you're, you're turn down all of that and you're resorting and reorganizing. That's what we think dreams are about. It's very restorative, very healing, very psychedelic. Mm -hmm. um, so ketamine works in that same way works in that same space of um, that dissociative effect. And yes, in medicine, we call them hallucinations, but they're psych it's a psychedelic state. Mm -hmm. And we and I, I would have been one of those people who said, psychedelics? What? That's not medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, ketamine, uh, again, and, and in those states, what, do, what are we doing? We're supporting that person's inner access to themselves, to the greater part of themselves, to that real authentic self, to that inner healer, to that inner, because people can heal themselves. And empowering that ability, um, again, with support, mm -hmm. with a preparation, um, with support around the work that's an ongoing thing, um, allows people to go into the areas of their body and minds um, where trauma lives where anxiety was marked, where memory was affected, where focus was affected, um, and it allows people to kind of really engage in that place. I think you bring up a good point into like, this is a participant, you have to be a participant in this experience. Like, it's not like you take it and the work's done for you. It's not like you take it and uh, that's it. You just take the 
pill. It's not some pharma mentality of the pill does the thing and you don't have to worry about anything. It's you actually have to show up. There is like the term work or whatever, however you want to term it, but you got to show up into this experience. It's going to be, it's going to be all the spectrum, challenging, beautiful, frustrating, annoying, exciting, blissful, all the things, but you, you have to show up. You have to participate. You have to engage in the process. You have to want to engage in the process. And there's a whole journey afterward, like you said, of like integrating it. The answers just don't happen in life changes. Like then the work actually happens. The realizations, the unconscious starts to become conscious. And then we actually need to start changing the actions. Just because it's conscious doesn't mean we change who we are. Um, so I think that's an important point that you're talking yeah. about. This is, which I think is what makes this such a radical transformation in healthcare, that it is a, um, you know, the results are profound but it's not just given to us. You have to actually show up and make the difference in your life, which I, I would assume would be one of the most beautiful things of your work right now is people show up, they have these incredible experiences, but then it's like, how do you support them into how do they show up to actually integrate and, and transform their lives? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> when um, people are coming to us, um, they come, they're Googling us in the middle of the night. Mm. Um, they're depressed. They're, they've been through the system. They're stuck. They're um, looking for last resorts, you know, other resorts. They're alternative resorts. They're looking for why am I not getting better? Uh, what works? Um, and so, yes, we get, we get people who are coming and need help and, and um, have gone through the system and they're treatment resistant. Um, and we give ketamine, um, but it's not the medicine. Like you said, it is the work that goes around it. Of course, when you're first starting, it's really hard to do the work. You know, um, it's really hard to change your diet. It's really hard to change um, your, you know, sleep habits. Um, yours, you can't sleep. Um, and you don't care about food, or you do care. Your you, food is your resource. Um, so. Um, Yes, it's hard, and it is work. Um, ketamine is that catalyst, right? It gets things going. It allows, you know, um, creates, area, increases motivation, increases concentration, um, takes a relief from that effect of trauma, that fear, the anxiety, um, and it works really quickly. Um, <clears throat> but comes the latter part, of the mm -hmm. next part, which is now I'm feeling better. Oh, no. What's my identity? I'm I'm supposed to be sad. I'm not supposed to be happy, because what people are th thinking on that, some, you know, something's different. But then I I'm scared of getting better, um, or, or I need help, or I'm alone. Um, so that support, that ongoing integration, is about getting to a better health, getting better to um, how do you reflect on these sessions, and what can you do you want to change? What, mm. Are you, you know, that integrative support around, I need help. I need continued therapy. I need to kind of work on these parts of me that are difficult um, you know, and had, and previous had outcomes uh, on that. So the relationships um, and yes, it's that whole empowerment to that. It comes slowly and that's the work. Uh, but making that assessment um, and really providing that support with medicine that can help trigger or activate that part is is powerful. Um, because here we are in medicine writing prescriptions for SSRIs and um, other medications. One doesn't work. We treat the side effect. We add this other medication because I can't sleep. And now I've got five medicines on board <clears throat> and nothing's working. Um, and it's, it takes four to six weeks to get better you know, before you see anything. And you might be suicidal too during that time. Mm. So it, it's, you know, and, and then you give treatment with ketamine and see, and sometimes not, not, it's not a magic bullet. It doesn't mm -hmm. work for all people, you know, 70%, you know, 80%, you see the Im improvement, but then you have that 20, 30% that, you know, still struggle, especially early on. Um, and so you have to, again, recognize that. Uh, but recognizing that the work is needed, even ongoing, mm -hmm. as, and this is um, this is what we assess, and this is also important. 
to the work. It's a commitment and it's a respect um, to the work as well. Because um, this work has been happening. Ketamine is, a, like I said, it's a legal medicine, but this work has been happening throughout time. Um, so here we are. Yeah. I mean, I see for myself, it's like, I think of healing, it's like, we're never like fully healed. Like there's just, we're, we're there's layers yeah. and layers. And like you said, there's a, there's an ongoing process, you know, into like tune-ups and check-ins. And I think it's important to know psychedelics have just been, we've had therapy for years. Therapy is great. We are now forming psychedelics have kind of, there was a swing into the spectrum of psychedelics are the answer. And that's the thing. Right. It's just a more holistic process. It was almost like, I always think of it. I think in some point we are going to look back and be like, how were we even trying therapy without psychedelics involved? <laughs> like it was almost like you are trying to build a house without a full array of tools. And, you know, I think we're starting to see some of these results with MDMA and phase three, what we've seen with ketamine, like therapy is a key part of this. Like that doesn't just work by taking the right. medication. It is... The medication is also therapy. So I think it's a, I think that's just a important note to make here that this is, we're, we're realizing it's a holistic process that goes into it and it's ev never ending. We never are fully healed. We're never, we never arrive at our end date of like, I'm healed, I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. um, so with someone that's coming into your facility, there's two questions I have. I want you to kind of walk through what someone could expect. Someone saying, you know what, I, I would like to try this. What would they expect coming into your facility? What is that ongoing process? And I know there's, it kind of varies per person. You guys create like a more, a very personalized plan with the individual, depending on what they're experiencing and what their life's at. But what kind of on, on average, approximate, what is, what is that like for the experience? And what does an ongoing process look like? Hmm. So... Um, yes, you're right. We we do take an integrative approach um, to um, meeting with people on a one to one level, um, and um, understanding, like I said, who they are, how they live, what their diet like, their sleep like, what's their medical conditions, what medications are they on, what are the treatments, what are the things that we can uh, help support, understand, um, and encourage in terms of natural ways. Um, so, how often are you working out? And this this you can look at this. It, you know, you can look at it, looking at blood work, making sure we can even do mutagenic testing, you know, all sorts of testing you can do to assess somebody's body health. Um, if that's something that they're interested in, but really building on, um, again, that who, who they are, um, how they live. Um, and then asking those questions about what kind of support, what kind of tools have you, do you have mm -hmm. on your tool belt? What kind of therapies and have you done? Um, and are you familiar with this process? You know, educating that component to um, the needs of the treatment. You know, knowing what it is like to be, to do this work, and that it, it is work. And it, you know, are you ready for it? Making that assessment. So that's our onboarding process, um, and it's a medical visit. It's a you know therapy visit um, as well. Um, and we, like I said, we take that integrative approach, making an assessment of how many treatments are needed before starting um, and what kind of support is going to be needed and in making it treatments are necessary for the body health um, and preparing the body for the treatments as well. Um, and then doing like six sessions and, and we follow guidelines and protocols in our training um, and evidence that, you know, replicates kind of, this is kind of how you do the sessions twice a week, coming in three to four weeks at a time for that induction phase, that first phase where we help kind of use ketamine to activate, relax, um, and, you know, get to remission, you know, mm. taking, supporting the treatment for the depression, the pain, the drama, the anxiety, um, and following that over three to four, like I said, three to four weeks, getting to remission. And we use observe, you know, clinical scales to make those assessment, but objectively, objective response to treatment as well as subjective response to treatments with therapy. Um, and then um, see them throughout the session. So that we see them on their third visit after their first, third IV treatment, and then after the sixth. So we follow these guidelines um, to support the treatment. Um, and then it's maintenance treatments after that. 
uh, as designed for each person. And no person is the same. Mm-hmm. Um, you can give ketamine as, and do therapy. Um, ketamine and think that you're going to get the same response. No. Everybody's response is different. Everybody's receipt, how they receive the medicine is different based on the body health um, as well. So it's because um, no person is the same. What, yeah. what do you, when you say remission, is that like baseline? Is that like first is, is majority of the people coming in, is it a lot of depression or you, is it more of a, uh, anxiety and depression that you guys are? Yeah. We, uh, so ketamine is indicated for treatment resistant depression, Got it. depression by itself, mixed depression with anxiety, anxiety by itself, generalized anxiety, uh, complex or PTSD, uh, acute or complex um, PTSD, PTSD. These are the treatment indications. And, and, um, and then comes pain, um, chronic pain um, as a treatment indication. Um, but it's more than that. It's, you know, we're treating again um, how, the, how ketamine works on the body as an anti-inflammatory agent, mm. as an agent that, again, increases what we call BDNF, um, that brain-derived neurotropic factor that allows for brain regrowth and reconnection, and also cascading effect uh, to increasing other neurotransmitters in the brain. So, um, you know, and, and, and as I said, this, this is kind of the treatment approach, um, six to eight sessions, um, making this assessment objectively using clinical scales. And remission is really what we describe it greater than 50% reduction in types of symptoms, right? Uh, improving somebody's depression. That, so that's 50% reduction. And these are on majority treatment resistant. Yes. So this is treatment resistant. They've gone through therapy. They've gone through standard healthcare protocols, medications, Right. This is this is a kind of I've lost hope people. Yes. <laughs> yes. So getting to fifty percent is our goal. Um, um and we keep you know, keep that in mind in their treatment, um and while they're going through the treatments as well. What is a standard like FDA pharma medication? Like what standards do they have to hit? Um in comparison to the results that we're seeing in your current field? Yeah. Well, Spravato is a medication that's FDA, um, non FDA, off label FDA use, but still has clinical, has, you know, is being supported clinically and covered by a lot, most, a lot of insurances for, and it's ketamine. It's a nasal form of ketamine. Um, um, and that is administered in clinical settings, but it's not the medicine, you know, in itself. Ketamine is also about doing you know, the, doing the therapy mm-hmm. as well, um, understanding why you need to do this medicine um, coming up. And so, um, remind me your question. Again. Yeah, think it through. Like, <laughs> let's just talk medication for depression, yeah, right. okay? And SSRI mm-hmm. or, or right. an anti-anxiety ma- medication for something to get passed and get approved to be used in that world. What are the results that? would be considered oh. good, mm-hmm. you know, because my understanding, like 50% for treatment redis- re, uh, resistant people, mm-hmm. that is astronomical Yeah, in comparison to a medication for a pharma company to get approved. It's much smaller yes. usually what that, mm-hmm. what we consider yes. the approval rate. Yeah. Yeah. It's surprising, you know, that, um, of course, ketamine is a, it's not patented, you know, it's not, um, it's it's a medicine that's been around for many many years. It's out of the patent laws, so it's not going to get you know that pharmacy, unless it, unless like you said, this bravado is a form of ketamine. It's one one type of ketamine. There's two parts to ketamine: an R and S component, the mirror images of each other molecularly. Hmm. Um, so um, they've taken out one component of that, so and kept the taken out the R and put the est form of ketamine. Um, so it's S ketamine. Um, and it's a pharmaceutical, yes, it shows improvement. Um, and yes, it's um, FDA. I mean, it's been um, studied um, to be a treatment uh, for treatment resistant depression. Um, and when we talk about these kind of results versus other medicines, it's it's significant, yes. But, you know, we were still looking into how this will be 
effective long term mm-hmm. um, because you can't really necessarily rely just on medication alone. Um, yeah, it's the to piece be. to the, the the therapy, the environment, the support system. Like those are the things that are actually probably moving the needle. Right. The medicine of the actual substance mm-hmm. opens the door. Yeah. And then the rest of the work right. is supporting the person walking through that right. door. Right. And so yeah. I just think it's it's important to, you know, every medic all the medications that are out there. What we're seeing in these, and again, there's still long term. There, there. This is not a cure all. This mm-hmm. is not. Hey, we found the golden elixir, and this right. is the answer for it all. We're just mm-hmm. kind of scratching the surface. It's just very promising. The results that we are seeing in comparison to what we've been working as a society as our tools before. Right. And to me, that's what gets yeah. me super excited. I, you know, I'm kind of my rant here is like I'm I'm one of the biggest psychedelic advocates out there. This mm-hmm. has been, you know, it has been incredible for my for my life and it has given me so much into understanding myself, the confidence, um understanding my place in this world, you know, all the things. It is it is key in my tool belt and I'm very big into like these tools can be misused. Um you know, I think what you guys are doing into your setting into how it's the process that's put in is important because some of these tools can be just used and you know uh, and very confusing can cause not done correctly can cause more harm than good um you know not done with like people like yourself that are in there supporting talking through this process i think the therapy is such a key part to this um so i just always like to preface to anyone listening like you know, psychedelics just aren't your answer to go right. solve all your problems. Um, and be very, like, I actually have, I think it's very important to be having these conversations because I think psychedelics aren't, we still have to discover a lot of things of how to embed these into society. Um, you know, these are such, pa- we are working with such powerful tools. And um, I think there's, we're we're learning a lot into how to utilize these and how to, um, so I'm curious on you with like where psychedelics are at, things that are coming online into, you know, new forms of medication, like we talked about potentially MDMA, psilocybin right. kind of seem to be on the forefront of the next ones coming in. Um, what are your, you know, obviously we have such positive viewpoint of what the big picture is. What are your concerns with psychedelics into where kind of the industry's at or ch- just challenges that you could see becoming mm. issues down the road? Wow. Um, yes, psychedelics are like a sacred science, a sacred medicine. Um, indigenously, it's been used um, for centuries um, and and used in forms of healing. Now in medicine, um, and we have MDMA um, come up, phase three trials, uh, very promising results, ex- excellent results, um, and is about to be released. Um, we have psilocybin. Uh, we have, um, you know, other uh, molecules that are in nature, um, and they're for a reason. Um, so, um, yes, it's promising now with um, psychedelics now coming on board and slowly, slowly will co- penetrate into the medical system, however it does. Um, and my fear is, um, as, as probably a lot of other people in this field, um, knowing that this is about the set and the setting, knowing it is the vital for people, you know, when they're doing this work with intention and how that intention is not only done by the individual, but supported by the treatment, um, is very important. And the fear is really, um, that if, and when, as it will, um, me- this medicine infiltrates into the medical system that is currently very systemized, very, you know, uh, <clears throat> um, a lot about numbers, a lot about, you know, medical records, a lot about, um, and less and less about that individual, um, you know, then to administer something like this, mm. uh, what that would look like um, to be an, just, an, you know, become another SSRI you know, mm-hmm. 20, 30 years from now. Cut the because, corner into... Because, you know, we're just giving a little prescription to the person and expecting them to work. 
And so is this going to continue? I hope not. Um, and so that's why our, you know, our, our philosophy in this care, um, and I'm not the only one. There are many, many people out there <clears throat> who are in our group of um, scientists, researchers, uh, and um, uh, students, community, um, people who have been doing this work for years, very much engaged in this in this discussion about the ethics of these kind of, treat of mm -hmm. these treatments, um, the safety that's necessary for the patient in an ultra level of consciousness. You know, there's so many ethical issues that come up to that, um, and how you administer, um, and um, and and so we want to maintain this ideology about not forgetting why we need this medicine, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, why we need to again really um, support the person and the community of people who are doing the work um, and recognizing the nuances in this treatment. Um, and if we do this in conventional medicine now, it wouldn't look like this. It would, it would be very different. So that's why at our center, it's very, very focused on the set and the setting, making sure that when people come in, they don't feel like they're in a clinic. They don't feel like they're just going to be, you know, handed over. You've done an incredible job with that. I mean, you walk in, your team is, you know, yeah, you walk into an office and your team meets you and there's this personable dynamic, but then you go back into the rooms and it's like, they're the coziest rooms you can create. You know, they are psychedelic in nature. You got, they're, they're, they're actually clear into what's being done there. There is great lighting. The bed is comfortable. The eye mask that you guys provide is like the best uh, I've ever had. I love having them. Just the music is intentional. The aromatherapy that goes involved, the nurses that come in to check my vitals prior is like, you know, they're there. Um, you know, your team can lead me through some breath work prior to kind of calm myself down. You know, I've, I'm, I've done this a lot, but I get still very nervous every time I come in yeah. and your team settles with me yeah. and gets me in this meditative state, checks in with me. And it, it feels like, you know, you're, you've checked in, your sister comes in mm -hmm. and it's, I feel like I'm getting sent off onto this. Yeah. Okay, cool, Brian, we'll see you like, <laughs> see you on the other side. And there's this like, you know, and I don't know if you guys do that for every person, but it's, it feels like. Got it. Like everyone's got yeah. my back and they're there and I feel yeah. held. All the fears of any, you know, having done psychedelics for years, like there's so much things you have to worry about on the back end of like just your safety, which is in turn flares up your nervous system. And you guys have just taken that out completely for the individual that all you got to do is show up and participate. Yeah. And not, am I safe? Are the police going to find me? Am mm -hmm. I, um, you know, am I taking the right dose? Is, is this too much? Is this too yeah. little? Like, yeah. ever, am I in the good space today? It's like all of that gets handled. And you get to go in and just, which I think lets you go deeper. Mm -hmm. And I think allows more to surface from that, like you said, safety. Yeah. It's the core thing of us as children in our developing brain. Well, coming into this, going deeper into the mind, Safety is you guys have, have nailed um, and done extremely well. So, um, yeah, I think that. Well, I I used to be a hospitalist, and um, I know what it feels like to be in the hospital, um, and you know, and talking to families and and patients in the middle of the night, and uh, running around in a white, you know, stark, bland, very, um, you know unreal feels at times place um and lights are on noise beepers sounds in you know, machines and you and and people are coming in in that worst condition that they ever could the most trauma happens at that time mm. right what does a place of healing look like it looks like a place like jail you know mm. it looks and and of course, things are done. It, procedures have to be in place. We have to have infection control. All these things are very important. Um, but a healing place should be very much about healing, right? It should be about you know allowing um, people to feel so that, that level of security in the place that they're going to be most vulnerable, um, or maybe you know. Um, so working, you know, they sh they should feel that they should enter and feel that yes, I'm better now. I'm already better. Mm -hmm. I know I I can be better if only. You know, I could be like this if this if this is how I need to eat or this is how I need to sleep. 
you know, music, um, using all the modalities of our senses um, to activate that level of safety uh, is healing. You know, essential oils are healing, you know, um, and they can be very, you know, opening to the breath. And breath is very healing. Mm -hmm. um, so why not bring that in? Why not, rate, you know, decrease somebody's blood pressure because they're anxious with breath and then measure their blood pressure? It's going to go down. Mm -hmm. Do you view kind of a, a very macro question come from your health, the, um, you know, our, our standard healthcare system, you're in your new system. Do you see those paths? Do you see yourself building something that will integrate with the old system? Or do you see yourself building, like there's no repairing what you came from and you got to build something new and the world that you're in now is its own lane that is going to develop outside of our current healthcare system? Or do you see them potentially having the possibility to merge in a healthy way? Mm. I wish I knew the answer to that. Because <laughs> that's, uh, I do believe, uh, and I, as I do among, among people doing the work here in this, in this area of science and medicine, um, that we need to change things. Um, and we are... Um, we should go back to the way healing used to happen. Um, and what is and, that? What is that way that it used to happen? Oh, just knowing who people are, just listening to them. The holistic look. Uh, just, just that. I, I studied narrative medicine, um, and, and uh, narrative medicine. I came to it. I thought I'm going to learn how to write because I was very interested in writing uh, about m my stories and uh, what you know, the things that you go through. Um, and uh, I took narrative medicine, and it wasn't. It was. It was a lot of writing, but it was more about um, learning empathy. How do mm. you how do you engage with empathy? How do you understand it created creatively? How do you get to um, learn about people's lives without just giving them a checklist? It's more about just listening and letting them tell you everything that's happening, and they'll give you the answer. Also, Got it. Um, so it it uh, you know. Bringing that in, um, how are we going to do that in the in the system that we have? I don't know if we can. Um, I know I used to teach this to residents and students. You can do things in five minutes. There's ways to do that. You can just be there for five minutes and give your full attention, give yourself presence to some what people are talking about in the in those critical times and come in emergency rooms, things like that. Um, and so, yes, I do believe the possibility of the merging can happen. Um, but it's a very, you know, it would require so much. Hmm. It would require so much resources. A lot of, you know, it would require uh, us to slow down. Um, and in critical situations, of course, in the hospital, you, you know, you got to be on. Checklists are important. Things have to be systemized. You have to do things in a certain way to keep things operationally effective. Um, and But it is still that aspect of resource, you know. Uh, are we as a society really talking about this mm. in a broader sense? Are we really talking about, are we, are we just looking at numbers um, and are we driven by other factors, the pharmaceutical industry and other insurance factors? You know, that's how the practice of medicine is being applied currently, right? Mm -hmm. And is that going to change? That's a bigger, bigger question. Um, mm -hmm. So I, it, at this scale, the merging of this would be very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, but if we take it to ground level, if we take it to um, building our facility, our, he our community as a healing community, you know, engaging doctors, engaging with other ther types of therapists, other types of modalities to healing, and really opening up that ground level conversation of who's in our community, what can we really build around the patient's story, mm. you know, um, and then direct it in that way. I think we would use our resources at the ground level, you know, and that's why this community is very important. Do you have a lot of doctors that are referring people over to you? Mm -hmm. um, where, like you, you mentioned it earlier, are people just Googling you and they hear it on a podcast like this and they're like, okay, I want to try this out? Right. Or is there some true um, traditional system that is referring people in and kind of yeah. Um, yes. When we first opened, I thought we were going to go and um, get our 
you know, talk to doctors, nurses, and you know, healthcare community. And we had a whole plan to do it that, you know, marketing approach. <laughs> um, and uh, we got our, our line put in in the, in the um, clinic center. And we um, went back a week later, and there was so many calls that had been made after our website went live. And there were people calling in. I'm, and they're telling a life story on the on the actually on the phone. Sorry, I don't want to make any HIPAA violation, but um, yeah. you know they basically I, we were shocked to hear um, that people had already started looking and were already looking for people um, or trend centers like this. Um, and we will get you know from the doctors, there's a lot of like side looks on. Are you sure? He, he, I, ketamine, you know. But then there's a lot of education now, even more and more. Um, I work with the UCSF as a psychedelic and theogen academic council. Our purpose is to kind of engage the community of researchers, science students, as well as community, you know, um, people doing the work in the community and and the underground um, uh, healing facilities, which we have to also talk about mm -hmm. and mention um, who have done who are doing this work. Engaging that you know, collaboration is is where where we get those doctors filtering through. So you are getting some that are kind of opening up to it. Are they yeah. doing the work themselves? I would say yes, as okay. as as it is important also to reflect with you know doing the work for yourself for yourself because as a as as I say I'm a wounded healer, um, and a wounded healers always have wounds, mm -hmm. and so you know the self healing is also very, very critical to this work because it, it does take a toll. It is, you know, um, it is hard work uh, being a healer. Um, and, and many of the healers that we work with reflect on this too, the importance of doing your own work. Um, and, you know, that, uh, that there's all kinds of healing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I would like to think that there are more and more doctors that are entering the uh, entering to come to you guys direct. I almost think of you guys like for us at Plunge, we're called D to C, direct to consumer. Like we sell, we don't yeah. go through distributors, we don't go through. I look at you guys as like D to P, oh, direct to patient. Cool. Yeah, like you guys like are, <laughs> your Google's the thing. Find us on Google and hit it and come to us and. You can connect to us directly. Like you said, your first marketing plan was we're going to go through the healthcare system. We'll get them to come refer us in. And then it, it doesn't know we don't want to go through that. We want to just call you and which I think says so much into how much the old system is, is, you know, like it's failing, you know, it's failing our world. And I don't put that on as I don't blame anyone there. I think there's a lot of factors into that. I don't think it's mm -hmm. as black and white of why. But it's not doing what it needs to do. And we're, you know, I look around and we're probably as as sick. It feels as sick as ever with certain things that are happening into what looks like over time, especially right. from a a mental health side, a, you know, obesity, um, some of these main things that are just driving into our society. And we're all a part of this. Right. Um, do you guys have, do you guys take insurance? Um, well, you know, you did, I'll go back to your question about other systems that are supporting this. Um, a lot of veterans, uh, are coming to us. Um, and we're again, one of the community providers in, the, in for the VA <clears throat> as well. So, um, yes, there are systems supporting this, um, in the healthcare system, recognizing the need, right? Um, because these treatments are more cost effective mm -hmm. in overall, if you literally look at it. You know, Interesting. There, it's actually healing. The cost, yes, it's a one time bigger cost, but into the big picture, you're taking someone out of that system that has to just kind of keep getting, keep paying right. into a system that's not actually doing anything for them yeah. or not really moving the needle forward. So, I, yes. Yeah. So there are systems um, that are supporting this. Um, this work and that's that's important to recognize, um, uh, but it will change, you know, um, how insurance is. Um, so we do um, say that we help support, you know, people getting the reimbursements from insurance, um, and insurance should take this into a factor in 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 its cost effective approach, right? Um, but they don't right now. 
um, and that may change. Um, um, but yes, this is a, you know, doing this kind of work requires us to have not the heads over heads of other systems on our on our backs. Mm. Um, you know, am I going to get reimbursed? These are the questions that we get asked in conventional medicine all the time. Um, how much are you going to get reimbursed for all this work you do? You know, you do 100%, $100 worth of work and you get paid 50. Mm -hmm. So how much are you going to, that question always overrides you when you're practicing in the insurance-based system. Um, so yes, it's we don't take insurance because we able to do this work. Totally. So it, and, it seems um, like most people stepping outside the systems are going to a cash basis. Right. Um, which is just, it, it, I've also found to be more straightforward for the patient. Yeah. <laughs> like insurance is so confusing. Mm -hmm. I would think that insurance has incentive, like I look at the two big players in healthcare, insurance and pharma, right. pharma the pharmaceutical industry feels like insurance has incentive structure to latch on to what you guys are doing because they are lowering their ultimate cost on a patient. You know, they want, I would think they want healing to take place because their bill will lower. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, is that yeah. fair to say? Or is that is that too naive to think yeah, that? Yeah, it, it, I guess it's complicated to answer that too. Um, you know, our, yes, it's cost effective in the long run. How are they looking at that? You know, uh, what numbers are they really looking at? Um, so there's a lot of nuances in that mm -hmm. answer. Um, and you you would think eventually I feel like they will mm -hmm. um, because they'll see the benefit over time. Um, and so, and yes, if it has to be FDA approved, it has to be accepted by insurance at one some point. Um, so all of the other modalities, the MDMAs, will be M FDA approved. Um, so they may be processing through insurance. But again, now we're systemizing something that is going to be hard to systemize. Mm. Um, and so it is, there's this constant battle um, yep. to how this care should be delivered. Um, and yes, I'm very careful to say that insurance, the way it is now, will be almost more difficult to provide this care. What would be the opportunity so right now it's like, it is a, you know, it's not, it's not cheap to go have these experiences, to yeah. go into this form of treatment. Yes, I think big picture, I would tell if you're actually looking to cure or actually get into remission on these, I think it's totally cost effective. Right. It's, it's incredible. It's worth right. it. But it is, some people see some of the pricing to get into some of these and it's very, it's, it's cost per, it's, right. there's a, there's right. a barrier for people which are usually the people that need it the most. Right. Um, what what do you think are options to, are these, what systems can get put into play to make this more um, open to people as less barriers for people to, to get into this type of work? Yeah. Um, it is one of our bigger challenges. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our mission is also for open, being open, being accessible, being... Um, and we do see that. We see that it's very difficult and we have a lot of patients in need um, and we support that um, as best we can um, in the treatments that they were able to provide. Um, so we need, you know, we will need um, and, and, you know, outside support to f facilitate that. Mm -hmm. um, we would need the community to facilitate the healing of the community. Uh, bringing in grants, having that support structure for those um, those sort of those sort of programs are very very necessary mm -hmm. to doing this work broadly and effectively. And I don't want to take that out of the equation because effectiveness, um, looking at effectiveness both objectively, is important. But how you deliver that effectiveness to um, people who are the most in pain um, and how that's delivered, it, it's you know, the, the outcomes on that, I would be very, you know, I would love to be able to do that, mm -hmm. assess that. I would assume that's why the veteran community has done well because they have resources right. and they can help subsidize right. or provide grants for those communities. And we're all, you know, that, that group has uh, bipartisan support. Right. You know, veterans are not yes. a right or left issue. Right. That is a 
you yeah. know, holi- yeah. like a, the full spectrum supports that. Is it, is there, is there thoughts of, do some facilities go the nonprofit route and look for funding that way? I could see total limitations there because you're kind of constantly looking for funding. Right. You can't, to build a business, it's like, that's kind of the beautiful part of it. You can f- self-sustain yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, nonprofit, you're just always looking for people t- to give you money to right. run the business or run the organization. So I'm just curious what other routes could be done in this field. Like where- Opening up that to other types of um, ways of collaborating in the community. You know, I feel if we can uh, not only um, utilize our resources for helping, uh, you know, again, it's a broader question of how we deliver. Um, if, I, if I'm if i a patient and I need somebody to help me with my leg pain and I need um, somebody to do holistic somatic therapy or, you know, a massage or, you know, building uh, physical therapy with that, how can I do that in this con- connected way? Um, and um, financially support that mm-hmm. organization's and its growth as well. Um, grants, um, bartering system as we used to do in the old days, mm-hmm. you know, ways to kind of engage that, um, building that network um, and making sure that those networks are aligned um, and make financially allowing for that connection. Some um, sliding scales an opportunity. Yes, we have you know? sliding scales as well for our patients who, um, and we assess that again, they apply for a sliding scale uh, and we make adjustments on our pricing because of that. Um, and it gives us, again, the ability for patients to come who need the access um, and the support as well for that. But it really is a big question. Um, and it's it's where we're, Healthcare is struggling because um, health delivery, but also because this work is very one-on-one mm-hmm. and very much about keeping that, not no, no restrictions around that. Um, so we're able to be effective. Yeah, the time intensive of just what goes into each person, which is the key ingredient. Mm-hmm. And it's also the, yes. the, the challenge mm-hmm. to how to work around that. The thing that I always thought was interesting with psychedelics and what – you know, what's coming online, you know, some of these other medicines, you got MDMA, psilocybin, mushrooms, um, ketamine. It's like the thing that seems interesting or like the more of the challenge with like psilocybin is it's a longer trip, you know? Yeah. So it's like ketamine's incredible for the, you know, this type of setting. It's yeah. a, you know, you're in for 45 minutes. You mm-hmm. have your, it's a two, you know, about two hour block. It seems yeah. like it's kind of the time for an individual to go yeah. in for a session where you have some of these others that are much longer. Yeah. And there's yeah. actual just practicality logistics. It's like, you know, acid might not ever be the tool. Right. No one's coming in for 10 to 12 hours. Like people have that work have to yeah. go home yeah. and have their, so I'm curious on what are, mm-hmm. how, because it sounds like you guys have plans to incorporate and integrate these different medicines yes. as they come online. Mm-hmm. What will be... What's kind of the plan to to work with those different ones? Well, Maps has uh, has developed plans for that and have been able to do that in as they as they've uh, processed MDMA through the phase three trials. Um, and it is long sessions. It is, you know, overnight sessions sometimes because it takes sometimes longer. Hmm. Um, and um, you know, they have plans where they're able to provide two two facilitators, one pr- licensed facilitator, one therapist or un, um, or guide or facilitator who's been trained in these in these in these modalities and um, and then you know these sessions are blocks of time every recurrently with the same people, you know, uh, with the same providers, you know, and and um, and a lot of therapy in between those sessions. You can see how labor intensive this is. Um, and it will be FDA approved. Um, how is it going to be delivered? That's is, the rollout. Is, That's is the... going to be the rollout. That's why, you know, it's the delay has been because recognizing that this is, this is, you know, how are we going to do this? Mm-hmm. So that when the release of MDMA is expected 2023 now, <clears throat> we're still waiting again. It's um, this year. It's thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This year. This year was supposed to be this year. Yeah, it uh, seems like so, it's been in that. So the the layout of how this will happen uh, um, will be labor intensive, time intensive, patient intensive, um, 
Um, but so, so and necessary. you have to be an accredited MAPS because MAPS for everyone listening, MAPS stands for Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Mm -hmm. They're a nonprofit pharmaceutical company. That's how they kind of describe themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. They have been the forefront of getting the research done, moving the gigantic boulder on a federal level right. to get. You know, they've been really big, critical into MDMA, assisted mm -hmm. psychotherapy, nice. um, which is a MAPS. MAPS basically owns that process, correct? Mm -hmm. They right. control it, but they also, the beautiful part is you have to have the therapy with the MDMA. So it can't, from my understanding, no pharma can come in and kind of hijack right. what they've created. Right. Correct? Because yes. it is this specific yeah. protocol. This is the only way that's been approved. And it has to be done with therapy, with the medicine. Right. Um, so, as a facility, do you does your whole staff have to go get um, go through that process with Maps to get accredited as a facility, and then you can roll out the? Yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> there's so many question parts to that question. Um, Maps is um, doing a lot, definitely a lot in, with MDMA, the other institutions doing other things, other substances as well. Um, and how that rollout will look, um, we will see, mm -hmm. um, training is necessary in my belief, in our belief, um, and the type of modality of type, type of substance that training specifically for that substance is, is needed. Um, and different institutions provide that. Um, and, um, at our facility, as, as will any facility now moving forward with MDMA, the requirements of licensing will have to be a little, uh, will have to have some flexibility around that because, again, it's so time intensive, labor intensive to get to people to do the training. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, but at least one is required to be trained. Correct, and then the facilitation with that. Uh, if there are two facilitators for got it, for so each session, one has to have gone through Maps's process right. or a licensed training program. And so, um, at our center, we are trained in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, trained in ketamine assisted psychotherapy, and yes, Maps level one trained. And yes, it is important for um, anybody doing this work to have the training um, and how that training is provided through licensed organizations and or even the ancient traditions. We cannot discount that. Mm -hmm. There is uh, there is in the, the indigenous populations that practice this science this for centuries and recognizing that licensing, you know, as, as it would, without that idea of licensing, but really that way of practice, that way that we pass down to generations being the players in this work as well, um, to be, again, to have that d collaboration between the conventional ways of practice, um, evidence ways of practice with the holistic natural ways of practice that indigenous populations have been using totally. to it's, be part of this equation. When you say licensing, it's almost like you're, you don't own it. You are yes. just now, you are, you are, it's, it's almost like a rite of passage. Right. Like you, you know, how it's been in indigenous cultures as you work through and that at some point you you it's a humbling process to be I think that's important that you know all the practitioners I do talk to that's like a very key thing they talk about is like you know this is we've learned from the indigenous world and there's nothing to not not take and discredit that it's like that's actually our foundation right. um, but how do we work that into our culture into our modern western world um, for anyone listening you know maps is going to need thousands to tens of thousands. This is a whole new industry that's being created. Mm -hmm. This is a whole new world of, of healthcare. Um, you know, it needs a, it needs an army of people to support this, to do this at scale. You know, this right. isn't where we envision the future of, of this being a, a common thing that everyone can have access to. It's going to need all these people entering the field. So someone listening, they want to become a nurse and they hear this and they're like, I'm like, this is the work I want to be doing. This is actually why I want to become a nurse or a doctor. What are the routes that someone could go to create a future where they are involved in this work? Um, well, they're the formal routes, um, you know, through training, there are therapy assisted therapists who are doing the CIS. Um, there's um, Integrative Psychiatry Institute. There are definitely institutes out there um, who are 
teaching and training and and um, um, people who are already licensed or and who want to advance their licensing and education. Um, and so there are definitely programs out there, and it's definitely a, something I think people need, whether you're a doctor doing it or whether you're a nurse doing it or a therapist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist or um, people who who are, you know, this this is more more than about the the traditional um, therapist, clinical providers um, who do who do this training and 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 facilitation of this treatment. It is also about the people, um, the guides. Um, how do you train a guide mm -hmm. uh, in who sits people you know who are trained to facilitate a session in the session itself who sit with um, people doing uh, again treatments like this <clears throat> so that um, is is it, it definitely institutes in training um, for that and that's growing as well is there somewhere online someone could look or is it you still go through your traditional med school nursing school route and then there is an accreditation afterward like are those yeah. still essential routes to go through kind of i i believe they are yeah. uh, i believe um that they you know they should be training programs for doing this work um, and they should be licensing attached to that to mm -hmm. become a proper center for um, providing this medicine above ground. Um, and I also believe that the traditional ways of facilitation is a form of training as well and that cannot be not discounted Got it. either. Um, so it, um, you know, this work is sacred and I think needs that kind of proper way of ensuring that we're keeping those ethics, those safeties, those mm -hmm. modalities, and and learning more and more about it as, as we do the research and uh, evidence around it. So I believe that that's an important factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know MAPS is a great resource for, you know, people looking to enter this work or it's just a great resource in general. Right. Um, you know, as we come to an end here, I'm curious what... We'll start with this. What is something that you're like in your personal work and your, you know, it could be career and anything. What what are what is challenging you right now? Wow. I don't know if I can end with this, but we have one more question after this. Okay. So uh well, I have to be honest. Um, you know, um as right now, um there's a lot happening in my own personal life, um, and in my um you know, there's an illness that has come up in the family that, um, mm. you know, personal illness with my mother, um, who is at the end aging and um, struggling with her aging uh, and struggling with her loss of memory and dementia. And that's, uh, and um, knowing, again, being a doctor, you kind of know, you think about all, the, all those things that, um, you know, that she may be physically experiencing and thinking about outcomes and you're always thinking, oh, it could be like this, it could be like that, you know, so, uh, and um, that that is my personal struggle right mm. now, um, you know, dealing with that um, while being busy, while trying to care for others and, um, and recognizing the care um, that I need to have for my, you know, family. Um, and um, it, but, it, you know, again, I started off saying trauma is make, makes you who you are. You know, I am who I am because of who I, what happened. Um, how how do we sometimes look at trauma as, as a way to process things, a way to learn, a way to experience, and a way to become even better? Um, and accepting the present and not just focusing on that, just being with that very moment that is most real which is the now. And sitting with my mom sometimes, just being with her and really taking away all of the fears, the anxieties about what could happen and what did happen and, and why is it like this and why, why, you know, just sitting with that and just holding her hand and being with her, listening to her as she tells you about something that you think is not important that she should, why does she bring, keep bringing that up? But 
just having that moment and just sitting with her and connecting with her, looking her in her eyes and saying, wow, okay, I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I'm here. We're here. We're connected. Um, I know that's a memory that, uh, that good memory, you know, taking that in, keeping that in. Mm -hmm. And um, it's beautiful. So even within these things, even within the struggle, there is beauty. There is a sense of faith, a sense of hope. Totally. And, um, so that's how we look at trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, that resonates a lot. I mean, my my parents are, you know, not not there, but same thing. Like I just, you know, it's not always going to be that I get to hear their funny story or something that I might term irrelevant or whatever. It's like, that's who they are. Like, it's like, that's my mom. That's my dad. Like, yeah. you know, and I, I, that resonates big time yeah. in what you share there. Yeah. Those moments are precious. You mean, the ones that we put on our iPhone and forget about and look at it later, or maybe not. Um, those memories um, are important. And, and those, those are those moments that we often are most disconnected with until we don't totally. It, right? We discredit them, and like, but when we can get, when I can get present with them, they're like incredible. They are like, there's a depth to them where it's just like I don't even know really what's being said or what. It's just being with their their essence, you know. It's like that. Yeah, I, I get that. I, it's something I'm more and more leaning into of just mm -hmm. like the acceptance of what is as opposed to. Yeah, the yeah. isms of of how we, uh, and and again, I I really hope to teach that you know to my children, to myself, uh, the importance of just being in the is and the now, and what is present, what is most important at this very moment, is the argument that we're mm -hmm. having, is that the most important thing? Um, what am I missing? What am I not seeing in this very moment? that sacred pause because mm. we always want to jump, you know, but giving ourselves that sacred pause to, um, before we react. Love it. You know? And that's the present. What, where do you see, where do you see Shaw Minds in three years and a part of the bigger picture? Where do you see the world of psychedelic yeah. assisted therapy? Um, where do you see that in, in three to five years? Paint us a picture of, of what, what you think we are entering into. Um, I think the research is so promising and so moving and so um, cutting edge. Uh, and these are, th this is happening across the country and internationally. Um, that will be that forefront. Um, you know, we'll 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 have some technology technological component to this. We we already are. We're already mm. looking at the science and the physiology of this work, and knowing that and really expanding on that. So three to five years from now, we are going to be, you know, psychedelic science internationally in the U.S. everywhere. Um, people doing this work are going to be in the cutting edge. They're going to see so much. Um, so that is that is I see, I can you can already see that that can or that's already happening. Um, I see um, a lot of hope in um, the the people in, coming through the ground and from under the ground from everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, hear word of mouth, people who are just drawn to this work um, because that you know either they've struggled through, struggled because of not having it or have already known it. Um, and um, coming together as a, as a community to really engage. Um, and I see um, that at the ground roots, that level of consciousness rising. Mm. Um, and that may be 15, 20 years from now, we'll have a more conscious society. That's my mm -hmm. belief. <laughs> um, and, um, and we'll be, the pendulum will, sw this will shift. Um, maybe we'll have more ways of being just very holistic and whole. And not have to require in technology, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the combination of those two things, the you know, the the science and the cutting edge and the technological ways of looking at this work is there. Um, um, but I think going back to the teaching the child begins with really engaging with the child and 
allowing the child's brain to also grow and advance and so that we can evolutionize this in the people and not so much, you know, in, we, we're changing the way we do things. We don't have to talk about the news as being a bad news. Mm. We can talk about news being educational, resourceful. Hey, mm. you know, the weather's like this right now. What, do we sh what should we be focusing on right now? Mm. You know, really looking at a way of changing our ways of, that we've been practicing. We're not, we shouldn't be fear-based. We should be really talking about problem solving, working. Mm -hmm. and, um, so teaching that is, is more the, you know, yeah, the next generation. Like less of us as an isolation is more in, plugged into the whole, like you said, the weather. Like what is, who are we during these seasons? And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's exciting to see what, it's also one with psychedelics. It's like what can get opened up, we obviously can't see. You know, we, we are only tapping, we're tip of the iceberg yeah. of who we even understand that yeah. we are, yeah. what we're capable of, what is a human being, what does it mean to be a human being? Like these are all yes. just things that we have not really, you know, I, th I think there's an opportunity for us to really go deeper, which will open up what that future looks yeah. like. Um, so. I see that in my son. Uh, I have three kids. Um, I have two older kids and one a 12 year old and i see that he's no, seen me um through this work and our connection is very different than my older kids he talks to me very differently about psychedelics and ketamine mm -hmm. <laughs> than my older kids do uh and his way of looking at the world in this very c connected way is very different than my older kids um and so i can see that effect on children and in, in, in the developing minds and, and um, their view, even the young adolescents and teenagers we see and ad young adults we see at our center are very savvy and know their, they know their stuff. You know? They, they, they're smart mm -hmm. and we, they have, they have kept their inner intelligence alive and that inner child good. <laughs> they, they're, they're resourceful in their own technological way. They're pretty savvy. So, um, it's really promising. Incredible. Where um, where can people find you? Find out about Shaw Minds. Oh yeah, we're online um, www.shawminds.com, and someday we can talk about why Shaw Minds is a name. But yeah, it didn't come up uh, today. Um, but uh, you know, Shaw Minds. We're in Sacramento, Midtown, in Sacramento. We are hoping to expand, and we are hoping to continue this work and and collaborate. Um, so call us. We're you know um, always available as you know as healers as a community. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for thank you making the journey into Plunge HQ yes. and having this convo and yeah. appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you too. Cool. Thank you so much.